Okay. What are we going to talk about next? After finishing CNN, we are going to talk about another common network architecture. This architecture is called self attention. And what is the problem that this self attention wants to solve? The problem it wants to solve is that, so far, the input of our network is a vector. No matter what it is predicting, like the number of YouTube viewers, like image processing, and our input can also be regarded as a vector whose output can be a number, which is a regression problem, or can be a class, which is a classification problem. But, what if we encounter other problems more complicated? Suppose that, the input is a row of vectors, and the number of input vectors, is changeable. When we talked about image recognition earlier, I also emphasized that, the size of input image, are all fixed. Now supposing that our input, is changeable. Every time the number of input sequences to our model is different, and the length of input sequences is also different, what should we do now? Is there any examples that the input is a sequence with changeable length? The first example is word processing. Supposing we want the input of network today. If it's a sentence, the length of each sentence is different. The number of words in each sentence is different. If we describe every word in a sentence, as a vector, if we expressed it as a vector, the input of our model will be a vector set. And, the size of this vector set is different every time. If the length of the sentence is different, then the size of the vector set will also be different. Some may ask, how to represent a word as a vector? The simplest way to do is, one hot encoding. You just reserve a very very long vector. The length of this vector will be as many words as there are in the world. Suppose English contains 100,000 words. You will reserve a 100,000 dimensional vector. And each dimension corresponds to a word, for example. Apple is 100. Bag is 010. Cat is 001. And so on. But, this kind of representation comes with a severe problem. What kind of serious problem does it have? We assume that there is no relation. Between every words. From these vectors, there's no implication that because cat and dog are both animals, the resulting vectors will be closer to each other. Cat and apple, on the other hand, are less similar because one is an animal and the other is a plant. There's no such implication from the word vector. These vectors do not contain any semantic information. There is another method called word embedding. In word embedding, we assign each word a vector which contains semantic information. If you draw the word embedding out, you will find that all the animals may cluster into one group, all the plants may be one cluster and all the verbs may be another. How did word embedding achieve this? This is not the focus of today's lecture. If you are interested, you can take a look at the video below. Anyway, you can download something called word embedding on the internet. This word embedding will assign each word a vector. So a sentence will be a row of vectors of different lengths. Okay, are there any other tasks that we need to take? A sequence of vectors as input? For example, in homework 2, an audio sequence is actually a row of vectors. How? We will take a portion of the audio sequence and call it a window. We transform the information in this window into a vector. This vector is called a frame. In audio processing, we will call a vector a frame. Usually, the length of this window is 25 milliseconds. So how do we transform this small portion of an audio signal into a frame or into a vector? There are hundreds of methods. And I won't go into the details here. There are many ways to use a vector to describe a short audio signal that is 25 milliseconds long. Then, in order to describe the entire audio signal, you will shift this window to the right a bit. Usually, you shift the window by 10 milliseconds. Someone might ask, why 25 here and why 10 here? It's a difficult question to answer. Ancient sages have decided it for you. You know, it will usually be worse if you choose other values. People have tried almost all the possibilities. And this comes up with the best result. So that's all. Okay, anyway, you can represent an audio signal with a set of vectors. 
and because every time the window is shifted 10 milliseconds to the right. How many vectors will there be in a 1 second audio signal? There will be 100. So a 1 minute audio signal will have 100 times 60. 6000 vectors. So, audio analysis is actually very complicated. A short audio clip actually contains a large amount of information. Now we know audio signals are also a bunch of vectors. What else also has a bunch of vectors? A graph. A graph can also be represented by a bunch of vectors. How come? We know that a social network can be represented by a graph. Every node on the social network represents a person. The edges between one node and another represent the relationship between the two people. And every node can be seen as a vector. You can use someone's information, such as the information in his profile, to build a graph. Extract his gender, his age, his job, and his posts as the information. And then use a vector to represent this information. This way, a social network, which is essentially a graph, can also be represented by a bunch of vectors. What other examples are related to graphs? For example, a molecule can also be viewed as a graph. Nowadays, the application of drug discovery is of greater and greater importance, especially during COVID-19 pandemic. Many people anticipated that we might have some breakthroughs on drug discovery. If we apply machine learning to this subject, in this case, the model needs to take the molecule as the input. Each molecule is represented by a graph. Every ball in the molecule is an atom which can be represented by a vector. How can we represent an atom by a vector? We can use one hot vectors to achieve this. We can use the vector 1000 to represent the hydrogen atom, 0100 to represent the carbon atom, and 0010 to represent the oxygen atom. We can use one hot vectors to represent each atom. This way, we can use a graph to represent the molecule. Since the molecule is just a bunch of vectors, now, what is the output of our model? We have just explained that the inputs are a bunch of vectors, which can be texts, audio signals, or graphs. What kind of output can we expect from these inputs? There are three possibilities. The first possibility is that each vector has a corresponding label. In other words, when your model takes four vectors as the input, it will output four labels, and each label could be a numeric value which is a regression problem, or each label represents a class, which is a classification problem. However, in the first possibility, the input and the output have the same length. This way, the model doesn't need to worry about how many labels it needs to output, or how many scalars it needs to output. If we take four vectors as the input, we should also output four vectors. If we take five vectors as the input, we should also output five vectors. This is the first possibility. What kind of applications will use the first type of output? For example, in word processing, suppose what you are going to do today is POS tagging. What is POS tagging? POS tagging is part of speech tagging. You have to let the machine automatically decide what kind of part of speech each vocabulary has, whether it is a noun, or a verb, or an adjective, etc. This task is actually not easy. For example, now you see a sentence like, I saw a saw. This is not a mistake. It's not, I saw a saw. But, I saw a saw. When the second, saw, is used as a noun, it is not the saw that is similar to, looking. It's a saw that can saw things. Do you understand? Okay, so the machine should know that. The first, saw, is a verb. The second, saw, though it is also a, saw, is a noun. Every input vocabulary must have a corresponding output part of speech. This task is the case that the length of input and output are the same. This is the output of the first type. If it is speech, it's our homework too. Although our homework too does not give everyone a complete sequence, we give the separated vector to everyone. But when they are concatenated together, it's a bunch of vectors. In an audio signal, for every vector, you have to decide which phonetic type it is, or which phonetic type it belongs to. Just think of it as a phonetic transcription. 
which is a phonetic symbol. Of course, this is not the real speech recognition. This is a simplified version of speech recognition. Or, if it's a social network, a graph will be given. Given a social network, your machine and your model needs to determine what characteristics each node has. For example, to predict whether this person will buy a certain product. We can then recommend a certain product to him based on the prediction. Okay, so above is an example of the same number of inputs and outputs. And this is the first possible output. What about the second possible output? The second possible output is outputting only one label for an entire sequence. Here is an example. Suppose we are doing some text analysis. For example, sentiment analysis. What is sentiment analysis? Sentiment analysis is to have the machine determine whether a sentence is a positive one or a negative one. You can imagine how useful this kind of application can be. Suppose your company has launched a new product recently. Surely you would like to know about your customers' opinions. But it is impossible for you to look at every comment. This is where you can apply this technique. Sentiment analysis. When you receive a comment related to your product, you let your computer determine whether it is a positive feedback or a negative feedback. Then you can understand how your customers think of your product. So, in sentiment analysis, given a sentence, we only need one label, either positive or negative. This is exactly the second type of output. The input can also be an audio. For example, in homework 4, we will do speaker recognition. The machine listens to a sound and determine the speaker of the sound. This is also an example of the second type of output. The input can be a graph as well. You might want to predict if a given molecule is toxic or not, or determine its hydrophilicity. So given a graph, the machine outputs a label, which is also an example of the second type of the problem. But there is still a third kind of output. In this kind of output, we don't know beforehand how many labels the machine to output. And we allow the machine to decide by itself how many labels it should output. Your input may be n vectors, and the output may be n prime labels. Why n prime? Because the machine decides what n actually is. This kind of task is referred to as sequence to sequence. We will deal with sequence to sequence in homework 5, so we will talk about it again in the future. You can think of translating as an example of sequence to sequence task. Because the input and the output are written in different languages, the number of words in a sentence won't necessarily be the same. Another example, speech recognition, is also a sequence-to-sequence -sequence task. You give the machine an audio clip, then it outputs a passage. This is also a sequence-to-sequence -sequence task. We will discuss the third type in the future. Today we will only focus on the first type and the second type. You can take a look at homework FA's source code to have a taste of how we handle the problems of the first type because the class time is limited. Therefore in this class, we will only talk about the first type today. That is, there is a call number of inputs and outputs. The situation that there are as many inputs as outputs is called sequence labeling. You have to give each vector in the sequence a label. How to solve the problem of sequence labeling? The intuitive idea is the same as homework too. Let's use a fully connected network. Although the input is a sequence, we just divide and conquer them without considering the dependency. Ignore the fact that it is a sequence. Just divide and conquer. Put each vector into the fully connected network respectively. And then the fully connected network will give us the output. Let's take a look at what you want to do is either a regression or a classification and then produce the corresponding output. That's all. Obviously, there is a big flaw in this process. What kind of big flaw? Suppose that the problem is a part of speech tagging. You give the machine a sentence. I saw a saw. For a fully connected network, the first and second saw are exactly the same. They are the same word. If you input the same word into the fully connected network, it has no reason to output different labels. But in fact, you expect the first saw is verb and the second saw is noun. But it's impossible for the network because these two saws are exactly the same. If you make this output verb 
and make that output, noun. The model will be very confused and don't know what to do. So what to do? Is it possible to make fully connected network? Consider more information, such as context? It is possible. How to do it? You just concatenate this vector with the previous and the following vectors and then input it to a fully connected network. In homework 2, the TA has already done that. In homework 2, we do not just look at a frame to determine which phonetic kind this frame belongs to. That is, which phonetic symbol it belongs to. We look at the previous and following five frames of this frame. We will see a total of 11 frames to decide which phonetic symbol it belongs to. So, we can give fully connected network the information about the entire window to make it consider the context of this given vector and other adjacent vectors. But there are limits on this method. In fact, for our homework too, this practical method is good enough. Even if the sequence information were given in our homework too, it is still quite difficult for you to do better. For our homework too, you can obtain the very good results by merely considering the five frames before and after. So, if you want to pass through the strong baseline, the point is not to consider the entire sequence. You don't need to do that. By using the data provided by the teaching assistants, you can easily pass the strong baseline. However, if someday we have a specific task, that can't be solved by considering a window. It's about considering a whole sequence to solve it. What should we do then? Someone might say that this is easy. We can make the window larger, which is large enough to cover the entire sequence. Isn't it over? But don't forget that the length of sequences is not fixed. We just said that the length of the input sequence of our model may be different every time. If you really want to create a window to cover the entire sequence, you should study your training data and find out the length of the longest sequence. In your training corpus, create a window longer than the longest sequence. Then you are able to cover the entire sequence. But creating such a big window means that your fully connected network requires a lot of parameters. It may not only be computationally expensive, but also be prone to overfit. So is there any better way to consider the information of the entire input sequence? Self-attention, which will be introduced here, can address this issue. How does self-attention work? The information of whole input sequences is treated as the input of self-attention. It will output exactly the same number of output vectors as the number of input vectors. For example, the dark blue vector here represents the input. Self-attention will give you another vector. Given a light blue vector, it will output another vector. Given four vectors here, it will output four vectors. Is any special about these four vectors? These four vectors were generated after considering the whole sequence. Later, I'll talk about how self-attention consider the information of an entire sequence. Here, for those vectors with the black frame, they are not an ordinary vectors. Rather, it is obtained by considering the entire sentence. Then using these vectors as the input of a fully connected network, models are able to yield the correct output. Using this method, your fully connected network does not only consider a small range or a small window. Instead, it considers the information of the entire sequence in order to decide what kind of results should be output now. Then, this is self-attention. Then, self-attention can not only be used once, you can use it multiple times. For instance, the output of my self-attention, after passing through a fully connected network, gets the output of the fully connected network. This network output can do self-attention again, as well as a fully connected network. Do self-attention again. Consider the information of the entire input sequence again, and then pass it into another fully connected network. Finally, get the final result, so you can put the fully connected network and used alternately with self-attention. It is self-attention that processes the information of the entire sequence. Fully connected network. Focus on processing information in a certain location. Then you can use self-attention to process the entire sequence information again. Then, use self-attention and fully connected network again and again. The articles related to self-attention 
the most well-known related articles, is, attention is all you need. In this paper, Google proposed a network architecture called Transformer, and the name comes from the movie Transformers. So when it comes to this network, we will have the pick tire of Transformers in our mind. We will not talk about the Transformer today, but we will talk about one of the most important modules in Transformer, which is self-attention. It is the spark for the Transformers. It has a powerful name. Its powerful name is attention is all you need. In fact, the self-attention architecture, I wouldn't say it first appeared in the paper of attention is all you need, because in fact, many earlier papers has been proposed similar structure. It's just not common called self-attention. For example, it is called self-matching or other names. But attention is all you need. Make the self-attention module well-known and become dominant. How does self-attention work? The input of self-attention is a bunch of vectors. These vectors could be the input of your entire network. They may also be the output of a hidden layer. So we don't use x to represent them here. We use a to denote it, meaning that it may have been processed beforehand. For example, the output of a hidden layer. After inputting a row of vector A, self-attention needs to output another row of vector B. What is B? Each B is generated after considering all A. So I draw a lot of arrows here to tell you that B1 is generated after considering A1 to A4. B2 is also generated after considering A1 to A4. The same goes for B3 and B4. They are all generated after considering the entire input sequence. Next, I am going to explain how to generate the vector B1. If you know how to generate the vector B1, you know how to generate the remaining vector b2, b3, b4. How to generate the vector b1? The first step is to find out other vectors related to a1 in this sequence. According to a1, we know the purpose of using self-attention is to consider the entire sequence, but we don't want to put the information of the entire sequence in one window. So we have a special mechanism. This mechanism is based on the vector a12. Find out the important parts in the entire long sequence. It looks for the parts that determines A1's label and finds out the parts that used to determine the class of A1. Or find out the information needed for determining the regression value of A1. The extent of correlation between each vector and A1 is represented as a value called alpha. The next question is how to automatically determine the correlation between two vectors in this self-attention module. Given two vectors A1 and A4, how does it determine the degree of relevance between A1 and A4? And give it a value alpha? You need a module to calculate attention. This module for calculating attention takes in two vectors as input, and it outputs the value of alpha. Then you view alpha as the degree of correlation between the two vectors. So, how do we calculate alpha? There are many ways. A common practice is dot product. How to perform the dot product? You multiply two different matrices to these two vectors respectively. The vector on the left is multiplied by the matrix WQ. The vector on the right is multiplied by the matrix weak. Then we get the two vectors, Q and K. Then you do dot product between Q and K, which is to do element-wise multiplication, and sum them up. You will then get a scalar. After doing a dot product on Q and K, this scalar is alpha. This is a way to calculate alpha. There are other methods to calculate. For example, on the right, there is another calculation method called additive attention. It is calculated by passing the two vectors through WQ and WK to get Q and K. But we are not using a dot product. We concatenate it together, get through an activation function pass through a transform, and obtain alpha. In short, there are many different methods to calculate attention, calculate the value of this alpha, or calculate the degree of their relation. But we will only focus on the method on the left side hereafter. This is also the most commonly used method today. It is also the method adopted by transformer. Next, we will talk about how to calculate this alpha. After finishing this, we can have a short break and see if anyone has questions to ask. 
In short, we use these two vectors to calculate alpha. Then how to apply this to self-attention? You will have to match A1 here with A2, A3, and A4 here to calculate the correlation between them respectively. That is, to calculate the alpha between them. How to do it? You multiply A1 by WQ to get Q1. Then this Q has a name. We call it query. It's like you have to search by keywords when you use the search engine to search for related articles. So that's why we call it query. Then, you have to multiply A2, A3, and A4 by WK to obtain the vector K. The vector K has a name called key. Then you use this query Q1 and this key K2 to calculate the inner product and obtain alpha. We use alpha 12 to represent the relationship between 1 and 2. The query is provided by 1 and the key is provided by 2. We use alpha 12 to represent this. The alpha or the correlation also has a name called attention score. It is called attention score. Okay, then for Q1 and K2, or A1 and A2, after we calculate their attention score, or their correlation, we have to calculate with A3 and A4 next. How to calculate with A3 and A4? You just multiply A3 by WK to obtain K3, which is another key. A4 are multiplied by WK to get K4, to obtain another key. Then you use the key K3 to do the inner product with the query Q1 and get the correlation between 1 and 3, or the attention score between 1 and 3. You can use K4 and Q1 to do the dot product and obtain alpha 14, or the correlation between 1 and 4. You just use A1 to calculate its correlation with A2, A3, and A4. This relevance is represented by the attention score alpha. Actually, in practice, Q1 will compute correlation with itself. So you will also multiply A1 by WK to get K1. Calculate the correlation between Q1 and K1. Compute correlation with itself. How important is it to calculate the correlation with itself? You can try it while doing your homework. Check if this step matter. Okay, after we calculate the relationship between A1 and each vector, we will do the soft max operation. The soft max here is exactly identical to the soft max we used in the classification. We simply take the exponent of all the alpha, then sum up the exponent value and normalize. Then we get alpha prime. So the output of soft max is a row of alpha. Originally there was a row of alpha. After passing through the soft max function, we get alpha prime. Then you may ask why we use the soft max function here. I have said that there are some reasons for using the soft max function in classification. Does it make sense to use the soft max here? There is no particular reason here. You don't have to use soft max here. You can use other functions. No problem. For example, someone tried to use the relu function here. Pass through the relu function here. It turns out that the result is better than that of soft max. So you don't have to always use soft max here. Here you can use whatever activation functions you want. It primes your decision. You can try different activation functions. But softmax is the most common one. You can try it yourself. Whether you can get better results than softmax. Okay. After getting this alpha prime, we will extract the important information in this sequence. According to this alpha prime. According to this alpha, we already know which vectors are most relevant to A1. Next, we have to extract important information according to the attention score. How to extract important information? We will multiply each vector from A1 to A4 by WV to get a new vector, which are represented by V1, V2, V3, V4 here. Next, multiply each vector from V1 to V4 by the attention score, which is alpha prime, and then sum it up. We write the formula here. Multiply each V by alpha prime to get B1. Then you can imagine that if a certain vector gets a higher score, for example, if the correlation between A1 and A2 is very high, the value of this alpha prime is very large. Then after doing a weighted sum, the value of B1 is much closer to V2. So the one that has the highest value here 
or the biggest attention score. Its vector v will dominate the result of your extraction. Okay, so here we will talk about how to get b1 from a whole sequence.